Mrs. Lucy Quest, thank you so, so very much for allowing me to interview you today. For me, it's a dream come true. I mean, I've always said that I wanted to go to a TED Talk, but I said to my students that I'll only go to a TED Talk if the person was interviewing me, somebody that I found inspirational. So surprise, surprise, I buy my ticket to go to a TED Talk saying that, you know, I'm going to meet the, one of the most inspirational women business leaders come out of Ghana and you're the one who's on the TED Talk. And then to be sitting here in London on the morning of the TED Talk, having an interview with you, it has to be God. So thank you so much for granting me this opportunity. I'm really grateful. It's, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And I, I thank you so much also for organizing this very much. Pleasure, pleasure, absolute mine. So I've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. to ask you. My first question is obviously, I know you grew up in London as well. Yes. So all those years ago, looking back, sitting in a classroom in London, did you ever think that you would be where you are right now in life? Certainly not as a little girl um, in London. I, I, I was fortunate that I had some inspiration. Uh, my dad's an engineer. He wasn't, he was sort of a you know, mid-level engineer in his company, working hard as, as most dads um, do. Um, and my inspiration from him was the fact that he wanted me to just be interested in what, what he does. So he um, would get me involved in the things he was doing. But the truth is because it was done at home, to me, it always seemed just normal. If someone is fixing, um, a, changing a fuse on, on, on a plug, um, I assumed it was normal because my dad would say, get me the screwdriver and, and we'd do it together. But certainly, I mean, I was born in Northwest London, um, Central Middle uh, um, Park Royal Hospital, um, and I was living in Halston. Around me, there were certainly no examples. So life was just really normal, um, coming and going and, just having my dad say, do this and, and, and do that. So no, I didn't imagine that one day I would be running a telecommunications company. Yeah, wow, wow that's incredible. Because I mean, for me, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, you are the first Ghanaian female CEO of a telecom communication, I mean, company. Like, how does that happen from, you know, like, I think that is incredible. So can you give us a bit of a background in terms of your upbringing, education, all those sort of like, yeah, take us on a journey. Okay. Yeah. So I am, I, I, as I said, I was born in London. I spent the first seven years of my life in, in, in um, London. Um, both of my parents had moved to London from Ghana. So a lot of the people I saw around me were actually the, the, the first generation of people who had come to um, London, my parents, my friends, their, their friends, sorry, and my aunties and my uncles, some of their, their actually siblings were here, some of them, um, and their friends as well. And for, for me, I think what I got from those people was a very strong sense of self because they always would talk about their lives from Ghana, what they experienced, how life was for them. So they, they gave me the confidence in themselves not trying to make me confident but by them being comfortable with themselves i learned from them and um, when i was seven years old we moved to nigeria actually because my parents my um, dad in particular likes um, working in in africa so he moved us to nigeria and i was really looking forward to it I, I think i was looking forward to the prospect of being in ghana even more than the prospect of going to um, nigeria uh, because ghana is what i'd heard about but nigeria was our, our, our first stop um, and um, i was there for uh, a couple of years two years actually until we moved to ghana so we moved to ghana um, all, all the kids and, and and my parents we moved to ghana we moved to a very difficult time in, in ghana which was um a surprise for me um, because that year Ghana had got, was got, suffering a lot of economic challenges a lot of people had moved into Ghana and um, coming from London and I think a lot of London uh, kids can probably relate to this I really thought that because it was always sunny in Ghana it was paradise that, that was the only thing I could think of the Ghana but Ghana 1983 was much tougher than um, those little childhood, um, little girly um, ideas. But it was a great experience. You see, a lot of the time, we find ourselves in places that are challenging or challenged, maybe because of our background, where we come from, our families. And when I went to Ghana, I actually experienced back then a very tough situation as a country because of the economic challenges at the time. I mean, it was at a time when there was a lot of um, things were scarce as well. And in that time, I l developed a sense of responsibility, maybe a bit strong at that age, but really a sense of needing to do and be more than I am. 
Um, because when you go through that experience of people having to survive a situation, you're part of it, you develop a hunger that goes with you. And in that hunger, I developed a, so, a strong sense of responsibility that said, well, whatever I am in now as a child, I've got to be part of changing it. Um, so I spent 10, 10, 11 years in, in Ghana at the time. Um, I um, went through the rest of primary school. I went through secondary school. And it was a, a strong formation of my will and drive to work hard and persevere. I, I really enjoyed my science and math in school. I was fortunate that I was in a school where we were encouraged even more so to be interested. So I pushed myself and, and made sure that I associated with children or, or, or young people who were, were like-minded, who were willing to work and go the extra mile. Um, and I think it's really important as a young person to, you, you, not, you may not know ultimately what you want to become, right? I didn't clearly have, oh, this is exactly what I'm going to do. But that sense of who is the right person to associate with in that journey is extremely important because whichever way we look at it, um, our friends influence our journey and we influence their journey as well. So we have to make sure that we're, we're equally matched. And I tell you an interesting fact. I'm here this weekend to talk um, at TED. The friend who has come to support me was someone who I met when I was about 14 or 15. And we've been friends um, ever, ever since. And so that tells you, you know, and she's doing well. She works for a financial services firm. She works in technology in, in, in the city of London. And it's nice to know that you, you set off on this journey together. Um, so after that period in, 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 in Ghana, I moved back to the UK. And I immediately got into work. So I started working at Ford Motor Company. Yeah. Um, I as a school leaver, yeah, that's surprising. School, uh, yeah, as a school leaver. I think How it, did like, you get that job as a school leaver? <laughs> <laughs> so, interesting, interesting. Um, a couple of things happened. Things had changed in the UK um, and it was a transition period where even if you had if you were born in the UK, you had to work before you could get a student grant. I couldn't afford to go to university on my own. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to sit around till I can go to university. I'm going to find, find a job. So literally, uh, Ford was recruiting people for the factory. Um, I went ahead and, and applied. My uncle had worked at Ford. So he said, oh, well, you know, they're taking people in. You should, you should go. Um, and I applied. And I remember so well at the interview, the interviewer, the, 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 the manager of the factory, saying, but you have great school results. Why are you doing, why are you here? I said, the honest truth is I can't afford to go back to school right now, so I need to work. Um, so he was very happy with me and I got the job and I started working um, at the factory. But I, I, I let that hunger to do and be and, and, and create more, stay, it stayed with me. And so what happened was even at the factory, there were people working there who were supporting their whole families and they'd say things to me like, oh, you're never going to leave here. Nobody who comes here gets out of here. So just accept it. This is life and this is how life is going to be. And I said, no, 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 no. Um, not arrogantly, but nicely. I want to do more. And every single time, one of the, the, so Ford and Dagenham has obviously these production lines with huge um, machines and this tiny little school lever. I was literally 18, 19 when oh. I started and people thought, oh, you're a baby. What are you doing here? And the engineers would walk up um, to fix the machines every single time an engineer showed up I, I said that should be me with wow. I, I, I that was a, I just every single time I would say that should be me I wanted to become an engineer and every time I saw one I thought that should be me I, I, I was unflinching even through um, it's nice to tell a story and smile but even through the times when for instance I'd go on night shift in tears literally night shift used to make me cry because I, I just couldn't adjust to it, but I had to do it as part of the job. So you have to learn a sense of determination and perseverance through that journey. Whatever you want to be or, or, or become, there may be blips in the journey. My blip wasn't, um, so for some people a blip can be you didn't make the grade on an, on an exam, don't worry about it. For me, my blip was I couldn't afford to continue right away. Don't worry about it. Stay strong, close to your faith, what you believe you're capable of, what you believe you've been blessed to do. Stick with it. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It will come to pass. Stick with it. So somehow I stuck with it through the tears, through the I don't want to go to work today. Um, I kept going. Um, and eventually through Ford, um, not only had I applied to university, but also 
I applied to be a sponsored student and I actually got this got the sponsorship as well so that helped me afford this entire package so you see you went in I went in to be a, a factory worker um, and walked out with not only um, sponsorship for a degree but that sponsorship meant that I got a bursary um, to help with my books and material for school and I also got to do all my work placements at Ford so every summer I was at Ford I was able to do a year out with them so I came out the other end not just uh, with an, a degree and I went to university of the University of East London not just with a degree in engineering but also having been having practiced engineering you know so practical engineering so none of that time was wasted at all because when I was in the factory I was learning engineering even though I was in the factory when I was at university I was learning engineering it, it just all comes together if you just stay focused and you take you know when the opportunities come you grasp them you're prepared you walk with them you step with it absolutely brilliant so um, that's how I came to be a, a full fully fledged engineer um, and when I finished I went through an assessment again and then got a, a, a post degree job as well with Ford. So it meant that all in all, I ended up being at Ford for 10 solid years of this engineering technical um, journey. In that journey, um, I came to the realization that I strongly wanted to lead business. You know, so I've been this technical person, um, driving, um, making things. I've done design engineering, project and project management, manufacturing, but I wanted to lead business. And when you you have an ambition that you cannot immediately see clearly how you'd realize it, you have to understand or evaluate the steps between where you are and where you want to get to. And I came to the realization that I didn't know things like marketing. I didn't know things like strategy. I didn't know things like, you know, how to manage the, the books financially. You can't lead and run a business if you don't know these things. And so I did an evaluation. I said to myself, well, I can either spend another number of years, I know 10 years getting jobs in all these functions uh, and learning them, or I can study. And, and, and learn these things. So I went um, uh, ahead and I applied to business school. So after INSEAD, I came back to London and I um, went to work for, I had a second son <laughs> after that. And then I went to work um, in investment banking. I worked for um, RBS for about a year and a half. It was a relatively um, short time. Um, but I learned a lot uh, in terms of how the operations around banking really works. So I was, I was, uh, based, I was in, in banking ops. But over the years, I had developed this strong sense. Remember I told my story of my family, my parents, the identity, and also wanting to be part of the journey of con continuing to make countries in, in, in Africa, Ghana and so on, um, make progress. Um, Ghana has come a long way and it's, it's, it was absolutely nothing like the country I encountered in 1983. But I had this strong sense and desire to be part of a, a, a change process. And so uh, I started talking to people about, you know, how do I find a job, the right job for me in Ghana? But I was open to any country. I talked to people in South Africa. I, I talked to people in so many different countries to just try and find my place. Um, and one such person I spoke to uh, when I went to Ghana was uh, the HR manager of a, a telecommunications company. So we got talking, um, opportunity when it comes, be ready. I'm literally in Ghana on holiday with my kids and this um, HR manager who I'm talking to purely from the, the from as a source of guidance and saying to her, this is what I want to do, how do I do it? You know, understand the market better. She was in a telecoms company, I was there, we'd had this conversation and they'd actually recruited someone to come and be um, head of their business development across the continent. So they were in eight different markets so they needed someone to run business development for the eight different markets. And they'd made an offer to this person and it fell through. Oh, no. The person let them down. Wow. And so, and you were also looking for a job at the yes. <laughs> and so she calls me back and she says, Actually, this gentleman has, has let us down and from speaking to you, I think you, you can do this. I think you're the kind of person who could take this job. I'm like, really? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no pressure, just come back into the office 
um, and um, we have some tests. We have to do psychometric tests and alphanumeric tests and so on. Um, just come and take the test. No pressure. If, if it, go, it doesn't work out fine, we had a conversation. At least you'd have experienced it. Um, so I go in and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm in holiday. I'm on no, holiday. holiday yeah. I'm not in study mode. How, mode. How do I? I go in and I take the test and she calls me and I say, oh, you're brilliantly on the test. Wow. You know, everyone's really excited. They're like, who's this candidate who got the, these, these grades? You, so remember, these are, this is not a test that is, are you an engineer? This is a test that looks at your general academic background and your, the kind of personality you have as well for the organization. So never take those school lessons for granted because the day you need to use those skills in a more general context, may come upon you just as a surprise. Um, so I did this test, got called back into an interview, um, and actually, right, right, I, 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 I made an omission. The original job was for business development within Ghana. I get interviewed by the, the, the CEO for the company in Ghana, and then he says, my boss needs to interview you. I interview with his boss, and his boss says, no, 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 you're not gonna work for this other guy um, who is running um, Ghana. You're going to work for me. I'm running Africa, and you're going to work with me across Africa. Wow. So I went from holiday in May to um, interviews and getting a job within a, it was probably like like a week, right? Wow. And then I went from um, May to uh, showing up, being offered a job to July. I was there working. Wow. So my question from that is clearly, I mean, even though you didn't know this is all going to happen, you were somebody who prepares clearly. So obviously preparation and an opportunity. It's and so important. Wow. You have to be prepared. You, you don't know when it's going to happen, what's going to happen, but at least be prepared so you have the choice to say yes or no. Yeah. Wow. yeah give yourself the options rather than just not be, not be prepared, not be present, and it's like things can just, just fly by. And that was really the beginning of my journey in telecommunications. I, in telecoms, I've worked in marketing, I've worked in sales, I've worked in strategy, I've worked in all those areas. Remember the story yeah. of what the gap? Yeah. All the areas that are not engineering, yeah. I've worked in telecoms. Right. So I've taken an engineering background and telecoms gave me the opportunity to um, work in all the other areas that I thought were gaps for me to actually practice those, those skills. Um, and you know, earlier we were talking about things like studying economics. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted you to talk about that because so my students are always saying, oh, but miss, why do, should I learn this? <laughs> why, what's math going to do for me in, in my career? What's economics going to do for me? So that conversation, I mean, I want to have that conversation. Like, I mean, can you tell us, like, how does geography help you? How does math help you? And how does economics help you in your Oops. <laughs> <laughs>